Thank you, Marge. Um, <clears throat> and you know, thank you to Saul and to, to Vasif and, uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I realized recently that I first came to Istanbul 10 years ago. Um, and it's a city that I uh, always manage to come back every few years. Um, I think this is my fourth trip back. Um, I just can't seem to get away from the city, and I'm sure I'll keep on coming back here. Um, so, coral, dust, smog, seeds, and puddles. These are some of the things that we think about, and um, for us, they're part of um, what we consider to be a list of architectural materials. Um, and um, so we've conducted over a period of um, uh, several years um, research into architecture and weather. Um, that's kind of the focus of our practice, but um, specifically on um, the relationship between control and uncontrolled um, as um, the relationship between architecture and the environment. And there are two kind of key moments of the, um, uh, I would say, of, of this history between architecture and the environment that we focus on. Um, when, we th when we think about control. And both moments are kind of centered around um, each of the two world wars. Um, so here um, in World War I, um, the, the philosopher Peter Slodzik, um kind of described this moment when um, the gas attacks that happened um, in the trenches as modernity descending on the human body. On April 22nd, 1915, German troops sent a cloud of chlorine gas over the battlefields of Ypres. Um, in that moment, making air explicit and marking a shift from the indiv individual combat to environmental warfare. So we see this, and it's specifically the invention of the gas mask, as an effort to control weather. And in a way, part of, um, uh, in a kind of um, un unexpected way, one can say that this is the beginning of the, the modern environmental movement, where you, an understanding of the air, an understanding of the environment as having, um, uh, let's say, uh, of, of being capable of, of having a threat and having particles was um, the, what was the kind of reason for uh, much of the kind of early ideas about um, how to control the environment. And jumping to World War II, after World War II in the, in the Cold War um, in the U.S., there were further efforts to control weather. And um, there were the invention of um, what's called cloud seeding um, happened as a result to both weaponize, either weaponize or to de-weaponize the air. Um, and this is, um, you know, the, the idea was that they um, realized that if they put certain chemicals, um, in this case, uh, silver iodide into the clouds and it creates um, rain, it causes rain. So um, during the Cold War, the idea was to use um, cloud seeding as a way to either create extreme um, extreme rain um, uh, on the battlefield or um, in the inverse to actually cause rain to clean the air in the case of needing to clean the air from, from gas attacks. Um, and what was interesting, I think, is the relationship between what was happening in the military and what was happening um, in the um, disciplines of, of, of architecture and, and, and design. That um, box there is a refrigerator um, designed by um, General Electric, um, GE, in the image on the top, those were the labs that were a kind of consortium between GE and MIT. Um, MIT's uh, labs were basically a subdivision of the U.S. De Defense Department. So it's in these refrigerators that the um, cloud seeding was invented. And much of what we um, learn from um, uh, the, the kind of creation of cloud seeding came from the domestic refrigerator, which would eventually lead to um, the idea of centralized air conditioning. So this relationship for us as a, as a kind of research practice is, is that we are um, uh, basically testing this idea of like how do you, how do you think about um, larger scales of weather and how does it relate to the scale of architecture. Um, so um, these are, you know, um, you know uh, w w what I would basically say like in a kind of different, two different examples, but there's a lot of other examples, but two different examples of um, how um, environmental movement was very much rooted in ideas of control. So um, the, the gas mass is seen as a kind of inverse air conditioner, right? That it's a kind of personalized air conditioner that rather than um, bringing in um, the outdoor environment um, and chilling it, it's actually a kind of a way to separate um, the, the environment. Um, our practice, I think we focus on this idea of uncontrol, um, knowing this kind of history of, um, of control of the environment that's embedded in the environmental movement, 
we're, we're asking this question, can we seek an alternative path to environmental design? And it's based on this idea of uncontrol or accepting the inherent uncontrol of, of weather and combining um, active technologies, um, all the kind of technologies that one, one associates with environmental design, with passive systems, um, especially with weather. Um, so the idea is to produce a range of semi-exterior and semi-interior weather rooms um, these are uh, what we see them as architectural opportunities that has no fixed outcome. So what we end up doing is in our design methodology, we're actually designing for multiple um, scenarios and not a kind of single final state. And that those multiple scenarios, we consider the projects unfinished until they are occupied by both weather and um, the architectural program. This is a key that we um, develop and change over time. It's a key to a series of drawings that we call weather drawings. Um, so it's for us more than just um, a, a way to, to speak about our notational um, drawings or not notational devices, but actually, um, the, like for example, the bottom two, the wall of air or the air corridor, there are ideas about how to mutate um, architecture with weather. So to rather than see, to see them as separate, but actually how can you bring these uh, together? So um, these are a series of drawings um, from different projects, which I'll show in a little bit more detail. But the drawings in and of themselves, I think, are a form of um, visual research for us. Um, this drawing is about um, uh, the corridor as a system that can be um, uh, understood in terms of, a, a, as, as the climate changes, the, the, di the, the kind of dimensionality of the corridor can change. These are courtyards, uh, courtyard systems and how they um, create what we consider to be weather rooms. Um, so, you know, between the differences of scale, I think is an important part of, of how we work. Um, these are drawings of, um, uh, drawings of dust um, for a project that we did, um, which um, in a way is more of this kind of scenario-based thinking. So this is not a single drawing, but actually there's a series of these drawings. And, I guess um, it makes our life much harder because we don't design just one thing, but we're always having to do several uh, drawings um, and we're never satisfied by just having one. So this is um, um, a kind of interface between um, a, a ceiling and a series of uh, what we call seeds. Um, so I'll show these projects in more detail, but just to kind of focus on the, the, the how the drawings are a form of research for us. Um, so this idea of the indoor city, I think is an important part of how we uh, think and how we work. And the indoor city for us is basically combining the scale of the urban, which is the scale of weather, um, with the interior scales of, um, of programs, of architectural programs. So, um, you know, either um, depending on whether we consider the indoor city or indoor urbanism, but the, the general idea is like the, the, the kind of contradiction between these two different scales and two different um, environments, between the natural environment and between the, the built environment. Um, the, um, the, I think the, the interest for how for for us in terms of what we think what we think about it is that what we're doing is we're trying to intersect in our work the un um, the kind of inherent uncontrollability of, of weather with um, what we consider the unpredictability of program. Um, <clears throat> so um, you know it, it, this these are a series of, of uh, different kinds of. of other, another series of weather drawings, but the idea is that we, uh, we we try to avoid using the word interior climate because I think that climate is has an association with being constant and and homogeneous. And um, uh, what we call call the um, projects is we're always referring to them as indoor weather, so that they're varied and they have in, within them um, the possibility of of um, uh, different exchanges between different thermodynamic zones or between um, other properties such as humidity or or or, um, or even static electricity um, so um, the in the end what we're what we're seeking is this idea of a participatory environment so it's both an environment in the traditional sense of the word but we are um, uh, really kind of asking how do um, visitors or people engage with um, the, the environments that we're, that we're designing, rather than simply responding to environments, um, thinking actively about the design of environments. Um, so my partner, Raquel, she's, um, she's from Israel. Um, this is a, what we call our kind of climate map, but it's also our cultural backgrounds. I was born in Vietnam. So um, as you well know, Israel is um, uh, arid 
uh, climate, and um, Vietnam is um, uh, tropical, wet, and dry. So these are two very extreme climates, and they're, I think, important to us. We, we joke around that it's only New York that these two climates can come together. Um, but it's also, I think, this map is also a way for us to think about um, how we develop our practice. Um, we tend to do work in a lot of different places, and um, what we think about it is, is in terms of where do we want to work climatically. So, for example, I'll show a, a, a project that um, is in Sydney, a kind of um, a series of workshops that um, we've been doing with the university in Sydney, um, and we, we were really excited when we had this opportunity because Sydney for us is a kind of ideal temperate climate to test out a lot of our ideas. So sometimes it's about, um, obviously, you know, as a practice of, of, you know, the opportunities that come to you, but also um, uh, it's also about kind of seeking certain climates for us that we're interested in working in and, and seeing what the possibilities are. Um, so I hope to, to add Istanbul to this map one day. Um, so um, this is an old project. Um, it's uh, one which uh, it's kind of categorized by the, the material of coral. Um, we did it six years ago, but it still is really informative to a lot of what we're thinking. And I show the project starting at the end, which is that um, we designed this project in which um, the structural footings, it was for um, the Art Basel um, Miami Beach um, Contemporary Art Fair. Um, we designed footings that were, um, we knew would be donated to be um, uh, sunk for um, uh, coral reefs, artificial coral reefs. Um, so um, working during the project with a marine biologist from the Florida Department of Environment, um, the footings were basically um, kind of the, the, the finishes and the kind of um, way that we had treated the, the openings in them, the idea was that they would um, uh, promote coral growth. Um, basically, the state is um, creating a lot of artificial reefs. Um, this is our favorite client that we always like to, to, like to give uh, recognition to. Um, but um, the, the sites are all around the, the, the coast um, of, off Miami, and the idea is that they're creating artificial reefs both to you know, uh, allow for sites of um, 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 marine life and, and scuba and um, recreation, but also for um, um, extreme uh, storm mitigation for, for hurricanes. Um, so that's kind of like the, uh, I, I show the project in, in reverse because it, it's an important part of how we were thinking um, about the project. So, um, so this project um, was designed for the night, and it's a kind of a art park, um, a temporary art park that was um, used for, it was the public face of the art fair. Um, these art fairs tend to be kind of satellites that get, you know, land in a city for, for a week or so. Um, and this is um, basically a collaboration between a, a really prominent New York um, Public Arts Foundation called Creative Time and the Art Basel Miami Beach. And the, the idea was to actually provide for public art that you would not need to go to the, you know, the convention center um, where the commercial art is. Um, so it's made of rope. Um, and part of what we did is we developed a kind of specialized rope that has a lot of, um, they wove a lot of reflective tracers into it so that um, when the rope moves um, with the wind, it created almost like a video flickering effect. And that was um, um, part of the, the, this idea that, you know, like how, how do we create um, a structure that um, the wind actually activates? Um, and as you can see, the, 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 the floor, or the, the ground was left um, totally open. So there's a kind of a structural solution in order to maximize the, the open floor. And this was really important to us because the idea was to, um, uh, allow for artists who, you know, the, the artists were um, invited to, to um, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, it was important to us because um, the idea was to, uh, this, this, like, in a way, we didn't want to predict how the, how the project was used. Um, so um, what was given was um, to uh, all the artists who were invited, they were given the floor plan during our design process and told, um, the, the curators where they wanted their performance to be. So this dance performance was in kind of the middle of the space. Um, and these are, th so these were the, the kind of four cities. Um, each one had their own um, institution that would then bring artists and, and performers. 
Um, so it's paired with actually the wind rose from, from uh, those, those days. So what happened was that the project really had very different appearances each day. So when the wind was more gentle, then it was kind of more like a swaying, um, uh, swaying effect. And when it was more, um, you know, the higher speed winds would actually produce almost uh, like a kind of violent um, motion. Um, what we had done was basically developed this idea of um, weaving two systems of rope, a white rope and a yellow rope, um, to kind of help with um, basically restricting a little bit the the movement, um, so it was kind of seen as a network of of, uh, of 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 both structures, but also of creating different scales of spaces for the um, the artist to to kind of um, progr self program um, according to their to their pieces. Um, these are some of the some of the drawings that that we produced during the during the project. Um, and of course, you know you you um, you do everything you can, but in the end, uh, we developed a, a series of details to try to simplify it. It was seven miles of rope that was hung in in, in a few days, and um, we spent uh, weeks and weeks to try to figure out how to how to develop a detail that can hang that much rope that quickly. Um, and um, in the end, they just kind of do it their own way, and the detail doesn't really matter. But you know, that's that's generally what we find in in much of our work. But the editing process of getting there, I think, is an important part of um, how we work um, so um, and, and I think that this project um, the reason why I sh I'm showing it as an early project is that it's um, it began our thinking about how weather is both um, an interaction and also in naturally invisible um, and how to give it a kind of um, ex expression so in this project what we had also done was um, um, developed a kind of working with a with a consultant developed a way in which the um, the weather, the the wind would trigger um, a kind of wind speed um, d um, monitor that would then um, be translated into specific lighting sequences. So there would be a kind of um, um, visual effect to the the speeds of the wind that it would reach. Um, so this project is. Um, I'm just going to show the video for this. This is um, a very small um, project which um, is part of this um, carbon fiber workshops that we've been doing for um, University of Technology Sydney UTS. Um, and carbon fiber is an interesting material for us because, you know, in the previous project in, in Miami, the, um, the, 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 I think the, the relationship of, of the architectural elements to the weather is a, is a more traditional one where the structure is, you know, solid and, and, and resists um, the weather forces and the thing hung from it, you know, what we consider to be envelopes or enclosures, that's what's moving and that's what's in a way adapting to, to weather. Um, with these workshops, um, we're fortunate enough to have um, to be able to work with um, with uh, uh, carbon uh, fiber. Actually, the volume's kind of high. Um, and the idea is like, can we develop structural ideas that actually, rather than um, be designed to resist the wind that the the structure itself is adaptable to wind um, so the carbon fibers is obviously the material that can can make this possible because of its very high strength um, strength to weight ratio but um, this was a um, this was the, the most recent one so this is the year two of the workshop in which there was a series of students and I worked with the students in which um, the idea is to a kind of um, a, a structure that is um, simply leaning against each other, but through its materiality um, and um, its uh, ability to, to flex, it's actually adapting to, to wind forces. And um, this one was really interesting because it was a, um, a, a, a collaboration with the director of the program, who's a, an old friend, um, Billy Furman, and he, his own research was actually on optics and perception. So we kind of brought together this a w thinking about weather with with optics, um, and I think is uh, we have one more um, one more of these workshops. But it's been a great opportunity to work with this material and to kind of have you know a kind of very um, uh, in depth two week process of of, of working with it. Um, so we also do projects for clients that are you know not necessarily all um, uh, installations or experiments, but we we really. Um, try to bring all of our um, uh, research thinking into our other projects and for us that's kind of the end that's why we do it um, 
Um, so um, this project is a project for a, for a client. Um, but before I show the project, there's, um, there's another kind of research project, which we had done um, um, an, ex an installation um, a year after Hurricane Sandy. This installation was a kind of um, collaboration between Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York and the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, which provided grant funding for us. And the, um, the basic idea is that the post-Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the um, uh, insurance agencies, they were, they were deciding on insurance claims based on just visual inspections of whether a space was contaminated or not. So we had this idea of how do you, how do you, how do you um, visualize dust, right? And, and, and in what way can you use or develop systems to actually almost um, create cleaning systems? Um, so that tube is actually a um, static electricity generator. It looks like a very innocent thing, but it basically emits either positive or negative ions onto a surface. That surface is basically um, receiving the charged ions. So it, it basically will get um, the ions and kind of attract it. So we had on one side of this um, wall, and you can see the dust there, it's kind of materiality. On one side of the wall is a, um, a, a, um, a, a generator producing positive ions and creating drawings out of the dust. And on the other side of the wall is um, a generator producing neg negative ions. So like as it becomes one side, we call the dirty room, and one side we call the clean room. Um, so we were really pleased. Um, when we had a client who asked us to um, do a project that, that um, required clean rooms. So I, I didn't say that we've done this um, installation, that we made drawings out of static electricity and dust, because that would scare most clients. Um, but we had a lot of knowledge from it. And I think that's a really important um, way that we, that we developed this particular project. So it's a, it's a kind of ruined site. It's an um, old boat um, building uh, factory um, in the East Coast. Um, and what, what we were asked to do is like deal with this existing shell. Um, and um, in front, there's a very large um, boat um, loading dock that's, uh, you know, like um, 30 centimeters thick. Um, so it's, it, would, it would be prohibitive to, to, to remove the, that dock. So we, we kept as much as we could. Um, and we also knew that the client's requirements for kind of clean room environments would typically, you know, traditional environmental design would be a kind of onion, therm thermal onion, basically concentric relationships. The inside one would be the cleanest and the outside would be the least clean. Um, but we thought, you know, that doesn't work very well programmatically, obviously. So um, what we did was um, try to develop an idea of a kind of intersecting thermal onion. Um, and so the, 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 this, the way that we did this was to introduce air curtains. These air curtains are what you would see in a grocery store, um, and they basically can be used to separate different air levels um, as well as um, reduce energy costs. But we used it as a kind of conceptually as invisible walls, and that, I think that's the really relationship to the previous project. Um, so as you kind of control these air curtains, which are low energy, non-chilled um, systems, that they uh, would be able, you'd be able to kind of con um, almost as if you're moving from one weather system into another. So, um, you know, I mean, the, the, what's interesting is that the scale in which we typically think of them as is, is at the scale of a door, but um, they actually can, it's just basically a, a motor. So um, they can work at much larger scales. And that's how we're um, testing this idea, basically to use them as walls. And um, the, the, the way that they generally work, the lower energy ones, is that they just capture the, the hot air that rises um, into the ceiling plenum and, and redirects it as a kind of um, air, air blade. Um, so it doesn't take much energy. Um, so, um, you know, this is the, the, the central space. Um, you can kind of see the, the insertion of this um, intersecting thermal onion um, uh, and the, the, the main area on the inside is um, you know that that would be separated. So there would be programmatic, programmatically different, th thermodynamically different, but visually connected. And I think that's um, you know so you would basically walk through um, moving from one system to another. So programmatically, the client really likes it because there's no um, there's no doors essentially. It's a building without doors. Um, 
and uh, so this allows us you know to, to kind of test this idea of like a intersecting um, uh, rather than concentric relationships which still allow for the um, uh, separation of, of uh, dust um, as as their um, as their product requires, and the upper levels of this kind of um, these three volumes. So y y if you remember, there was a kind of very large volume, um, the, the the which the largest the large volume is actually the same size as the Tate Modern's turbine hall. So it's it's a great space, but it's actually a huge waste um, and and very difficult to make it work for. Um, a ma manufacturing center. So um, this idea of intersecting different volumes allows for um, different scales of program. And there's some exhibition areas and some um, uh, an, an education component where they'd be training um, as well as administration. So it's a kind of mixed-use facility. Um, and what we had developed as an idea for the, um, in the bottom right one, is a, um, is the the idea for the for the, how to how to deal with this very large boat dock and and what we put there was a was a um, a, a kind of garden island basically, um, and the garden island basically would capture the rainwater that typically would just flow into the bay, um, bring it into a cistern underneath, and um, so you can, in in the kind of front left you'd see you'd see this this garden island. So it's also a kind of park. It's actually pretty big. The scale of the project is really big. So that, that garden island is quite big and would basically be a kind of lunch spot for almost all the, the employees. Um, so this is um, some research that we're doing for um, a book. And it's, it, this overlaps with some thinking that um, of, of, of um, for a studio that I just taught at Columbia. But it's about this relationship between the difference between weather and climate. Um, which you know one can say weather is, is what happens in the next week climate is, is the long term longer duration of time um, but we're maybe thinking more differently about it that you know that that maybe weather is um, that which can be experienced and climate is that which can be um, analyzed right and it's actually it's climate as an abstraction is actually probably why it's become so political um, so we are doing a series of studies research programs on thinking about typologies in terms of this relationship between weather and climate. Um, and uh, you know, so this is the drawing that you saw of, of thinking of looking at schools into spaces of schools, the corridor and the courtyard, and how they can be um, adaptable and how they would change depending on the climate type. Um, so these are what we're calling weather rooms. So the the way that we began it is to look at a series of typologies for schools um, and uh, those typologies are um, uh, basically like this one you may recognize as Fuji Kindergarten by Tezuka Architects um, where we on the right hand draw the project in terms of its uh, weather um, kind of adaptability and on the left in terms of what we call program determinancy. So how flexible or fixed the program is in its relationship to um, how um, kind of adaptable that space is to, to weather. Um, so there's a series of uh, climates that we looked at, um, three different climate types. So basically the idea is that we looked at schools in three different climate types, looking mostly at corridors, courtyards, and weather rooms. Um, so much of the project is undesigned, and I think that's an important part of the work, um, which is to say that this is kind of like designing um, strategies, and we don't see these as, as buildings necessarily, but strategies for um, future projects, right? So um, this would be the, um, I think, the, the humid continental climate. Um, and um, what we're showing is like the possible overlap zones in which you can introduce um, kind of adaptable weather spaces and how they relate to the kind of more fixed programs. Um, so I think that you know, I mean, it, what I think what's interesting for us is to imagine that if we did this for a series of typologies, um, you know, the next one would be libraries, the, the one after perhaps museums, and, and to look at these typologies through um, just the lens of very specific spaces, they, they probably would not be the same spaces for the different programs, but that um, we're in a way um, designing for the unfinished qualities of the project in order to develop, um, to allow for its development further. Um, so um, this is a little kind of break in the, the series of projects. 
and this is more about the future um, rather than past work. Um, so we were awarded the Rome Prize um, uh, this year from the American Academy in Rome, and so where um, um, you know my partner and I will be moving to Rome um, to this amazing place. Um, so the the kind of Rome Prize idea is, is both you know how do we take advantage of this opportunity to both um, kind of answer some questions that we've had with a, a lot of our work, but also to see it as perhaps a break and, and um, new opportunities or new ways to translate this thinking, right? So we've done a series of, of, of research and, and projects and think and, and teaching all along these themes, um, and we see the Rome Prize as a way to, um, to kind of self-reflect, and, and that's how the American Academy sees it. So the American Academy, um, they, they actually, though you are selected partially based on the proposal you, you put together, which, which I'll be showing, um, they entirely recognize that when you're in Rome, then you're in Rome and, and everything can change. So um, they, there's a joke that if you, you know, do the project that you propose, then you know, there's this, it's a, a more of an exception than a, than a rule. Um, and the, you know, the community there is, uh, is also about this um, kind of um, cross-disciplinary um, um, co conversation. So there are 11 disciplines. Um, roughly half of them are, are what they would call the scholars who, who are um, do doctoral or postdoctoral um, fellows. And then the other half are the creatives. So um, perhaps the distinction of, between them is, is not necessarily um, and the right way to think between a scholar and a creative, but I think that what's amazing is to have the opportunity to be in the conversation with, you know, in this, in this place for a year with um, people from all different um, um, disciplines. Um, so we're looking at Piranesi. And um, we're looking, obviously, at something that's very well-known architecturally, um, very much associated with Rome. Um, but we're seeing Piranesi as basically an early example of what we call our weather drawings. So these, um, this kind of, this appearance of the Roman Forum in the 1800s rising out of the dust um, and all the kind of weeds and plants are growing on the, on the, um, the architecture. That's for us the, the, the interest in, in studying these drawings. And for us, this is actually not a ruin, you know, like in a way this, this would be the ruin. And the moment that all of the weather is removed, it's actually a kind of, it's been frozen in time, right? Um, and, and, and if weather is something that is um, about kind of shorter period of time, then um, we see these as kind of, um, uh, we're, perhaps we're, we're, I mean, obviously we're, you know, very excited to, to be there, but um, it's that relationship between the, the kind of um, preserved site and the ruin, the drawing of the ruin, I think that's really interesting for us. Um, so that's part of the study, but really it's about looking at Piranesi in a way to look forward. Um, so, you know, these relationships, these moments where a column almost appears in his etchings to uh, dissolve into the sky or become a cloud, or how um, the kind of overgrown weeds are in a way part, become a kind of patterning that um, is um, uh, in parallel to the to the flutes of the of the column. I mean th that that I think those are the relationships that we're super interested in. We're going to bring this um, research, um, you know, uh, and 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 obviously there's a lot of Piranesi drawings in Rome, but we're going to use it to rethink what we call the contemporary ruins. Um, so this is a map of all of the unfinished projects in 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 Italy, um, and I just realized that I put it in upside down. So. Um, Sicily is now above um, Tuscany, which actually would be interesting. Um, but uh, so if you imagine Rome upside down or Italy upside down, th there's a lot of projects in southern Italy. Um, Rome actually has a ministry of unfinished projects. They come from two economic crises, one in the kind of uh, 80s um, uh, and then another, and the most recent one. So all of these unfinished projects we see them as sites. So this is, you know, roadways. Um, uh, this is, I guess, above is a kind of like a canal, and the, the bottom is a is a is a bridge um, spanning a valley that was uh, incomplete, and they never finished it. So someone decided to build their house there. Um, and even contemporary examples. This is outside of Rome. This is the um, in Torre Vergata, 
um, um, Calatrava Natatorium that was only partially built, the structural frame was built. Um, and these are, you know, basically we see these as open air weather structures. And that's really what the, 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 um, the thrust of our, our proposal in Rome is to, to not only um, kind of to continue to research our ideas about weather and architecture, but also to kind of look at the contemporary ruin as, um, as sites for opportunities and not as failures. And that, um, you know, a ruin is, is for us not about, um, uh, first, not about a kind of end of an architectural act, but perhaps a, a transition to another one, right? That, um, you know, there was reasons why this, these projects were not built, but we're not interested in finishing the projects in any way, but actually as seeing them as a break and to ask, how do we intervene in them um, architecturally, programmatically? Um, so, um, so this project is a kind of recent one. The climate is Mediterranean. Um, it's um, f in Israel, it's uh, for the Design Museum Cholon, which is um, a museum designed by Ron Arad. Um, and it's a kind of, un the site is an unused plaza. Um, um, the plaza is, I mean, it's, it, besides um, the fact that it, it offers absolutely no shade, um, it's, it's a kind of, there's just, it's not, let's say, activated programmatically or in terms of any kind of public facilities. So um, that was the competition brief. Um, and we looked at this idea of um, how to think about shade not as a kind of static relationship between um, the sun moving around um, an object, but actually to think of shade as a more dynamic relationship. Um, and this relationship is one activated by wind. So um, the field of balls um, is basically creates um, a kind of landscape, of, of what we call a flat landscape um, that's suspended in the air made up only of uh, a, a mesh surface, uh, almost um, almost invisible, and um, thirty thousand balls. And the the project uses three different sizes of balls. Um, and the idea is to try to not allow for uh, any kind of grid like formations, but actually the different size balls would um, uh, would would create these kind of um, 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 both sun and, and shade effects. Um, this is a drawing, one of the weather drawings. This is a drawing of one of the scenarios that we imagined when we had done the competition. Um, and these are some photos from the, from the, from the construction, um, a, or after the construction. Um, and of course, you know, the, the thing about our kind of fascination with the uncontrolled is that it really was uncontrolled. And we, had, uh, we, we, never, never, we generally never know whether a project will work um, when we go into it. Um, but I think that's, well, that's part of the thrill, but also part of the, um, you know, trauma <laughs> of doing this kind of work. Um, the, um, so as you can see, it's a very simple structure. We're kind of evoking um, the, um, the, the agricultural uh, landscape of Israel, um, uh, greenhouse technologies. There are uh, a lot in the, in the country, and the country is really a kind of pioneer in a lot of agri um, agricultural systems for, for extreme weather um, environments. Um, so that's the kind of structural system that we used, and we basically hung um, um, we hung a, um, a, a, a ceiling. So the, the greenhouse structure has no panels, has no roof, has no walls. And we hung below the, the roof truss is a, a mesh ceiling. And the mesh is a kind of a very thin metal mesh. Um, and it's dead flat. So basically, um, as the wind changes from one uh, the, generally in, the, in, in, in Tel Aviv, the wind changes in the afternoon as basically in the morning the, the wind comes in from the south, from the desert, and in the afternoon it, it changes direction. The afternoon breeze comes in from the Mediterranean. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of moments that we were really interested in. Um, and, and I think in a way this is the kind of, um, we're, um, that, that was when we knew the project had worked, right? Um, but the idea is that it's un- for us, it's unfinished until that, until, the, until it gets activated by wind, until people are using it. And we had designed a series of different programs. So the city and the museum, they both programmed it for different things. So um, the city um, held some different, they had some markets there, some weekend markets. Um, there was a kind of um, uh, um, loan li book, book loan library that we had kind of worked with one of the near neighboring institutions to, to have um, there. and, and <laughs> So I think that the, the, the general idea is that as, as the shadow is moving, it's not moving simply from the time of day, but also from the wind uh, patterns. 
and that, that kind of creates um, different responses or different experiences um, to, to the project, depending on, on, on the... Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so the multiple program, I think, is, is really important to us. I mean, we're both, I think, um, heavily um, interested in how program uh, creates these participatory environments that activate public space, but we're also uh, interested in this idea that program now is increasingly less um, less fixed, you know, a building can be designed for one program and become used for another program. And I think that's um, part of um, building now. And, and so in these drawings, these are kind of like speculations, like how, what would it be if it would become a bookstore or to even become a house? And these are, I think the, the idea is that like we're designing for very specific conditions which are um, changing, but they, um, programmatically, we, we see um, multiple possibilities, and that's, I think, perhaps part of this interest in the, in the unpredictability of, of the projects. Um, so this is a, a last project. Um, it's a competition we did for a, um, um, a kindergarten in, in China. Um, and China has this um, issue with their um, kind of mass migration from, from, the, from the countryside to the cities, and the government is creating what they call medium-sized cities. There's also small-sized cities. Medium. So they're basically trying to create different scales of cities so that the countryside doesn't empty out. Um, uh, so this was a, a kindergarten for one of those cities. Um, we were interested in, like, basically just very simply a, a kind of main building in a, in a loop, a, a loop that goes around it. Um, that loop is um, open to, creates a courtyard for, for a kind of play area, but it also is um, um, open to being um, adaptable to, to, to weather. Um, so these are, you know, for, for the drawings. So the, the, the main building, the, the kind of, the majority of the kindergarten programs are um, in an open, flexible space that has a has a, this um, support core, it's both structure as well as environmentally um, organizing the dif the different zones, um, uh, and you know we were using a lot of ideas about um, you know kind of extra thick walls, recessed windows, like so you know I mean for us this is thinking about climate. This is you know how to be how to think about climate as um, in terms of resilience, but. Um, our interest in weather is, is perhaps the more conceptual or um, um, critical a part of the, 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 the work. Um, so the, the, the geometries or the kind of sculpted forms come from um, an idea of, of using um, roof pools. Um, so capturing water in roof pools and then using that um, water to basically um, it both irrigate or uh, for gray water system. So rather than capturing water and bringing it down to a cistern, which you then need to pump back up, the idea is basically that you um, already um, uh, just leave it up there. And, and, and in this kind of climate where you do already design for snow loading, it, already, it makes sense because the snow load is always more than the load of, of, of capturing this, this water. Um, so it, it's just basically taking advantage of, of something that's already been designed for. Um, so um, th this for us are kind of giant puddles um, and it's in a way the ma a material um, aspect to the building but also creates the, the kind of spaces that happen within. Um, the central core um, is actually a way as we see it as a, as a lung that, that ventilates the, the project. So um, through a series of chilled uh, ceilings and heated floors, we bring the air through this lung and, and it evacuates up through um, ridge um, line. Uh, um, skylights um, and this would be the main space which again is kind of programmatically um, adaptable um, all the kind of furniture would be stored within the walls and um, they can change the configurations and, and programs of each of the three different um, quad not quadrants but th the three different sectors um, de depending on where and when uh, it is during the day So this is imagining the project as a library, as housing, and as office. So to say that you know we, the the location of the project is very specific. So its relationship to environmental conditions is we know, and that's what we're designing for. But programmatically, 
um, we can't control what happens to the project. And I think it's for us important speculations of like how these projects can have other lives or, or in a way related to their, our ideas, both of weather, but also of the unfinished project. And I think that's kind of um, where I will end. Um, you know, I think that, you know, maybe I can end by s asking the, a question that is probably um, more, rel more typically answered in the beginning, but why weather? And I think that weather, um, for us, it's both universal and it's subjective, meaning that we all know weather. It's, it's a conversation we all have. We all experience it, but we all experience it differently. And I think that's um, the subjectivity of weather is an important way for us to think about um, the architectural experience. So, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the, the, it, and a lot of our thinking is about questioning this idea of comfort or the term comfort. And um, comfort as universal, I think, is a, is a kind of um, a, a maybe a, um, one of the one of the kind of um, problems that came out of the modern movement is, is defining comfort through engineering specifications, but um, perhaps to think about comfort more in terms of varied and um, uh, diverse uh, exchanges between different weather in interior weather systems. Um, and then, you know, for us, we're um, I guess three months <laughs> three months away from moving to Rome. Um, the um, for you know basically to look at this interface between architecture and weather I think is um, you know what we would be doing but also um, to kind of look at continue to use our thinking to question the terms of architecture the the, the language of architecture um, and that you know that's I think um, maybe the important part for us is that um, rather than thinking of um, environmental design as providing uh, solutions. Um, we call it the design of environments because we think it's act more active and more um, uh, where more um, for us more engaging because we're first asking the questions um, and um, rather than just providing answers. So um, I end with this image of the air conditioner and the gas mask because it's an important I image for us because it um, summarizes a few things um, that of relationship between the environmental control and environmental uncontrolled or um, programmatically determined or programmatically unpredictable. And maybe the last is between this idea of um, where the boundaries of architecture is and where the boundaries of the body is and the boundaries of the environment. Thank you. Thank you.